as we come to discuss the idea of politics at the level that is above the nation or above the state, it's important to remind ourselves of some of the great processes that took place in this field in the history. Before the last World War, for roughly 5,000 years, history was dominated by empires. The empires came and went, but the idea of the empire at the supranational level remained largely unchallenged. A major challenge came in 1776, when the British Empire refused to give equal rights to its colonies in America, and those colonies declared independence. The British, and it might be related to their racist perceptions, learned eventually to accept the independence of their white-dominated colonies in America, but continued to uphold the idea of the empire and expand their rule in other parts of the world. They continued doing so until Hitler took these ideals of racism and imperialism to the extreme and in the name of those ideals bombed the hell out of London. And so, as the British and other European empires were fighting now for their own independence, they found themselves fighting not only Nazi Germany, but also the very ideas that they used to cherish of imperialism and racism. And so, the Great World War brought humanity to a grand crossroads. For the first time in history, it was evident that the idea of empire could no longer serve as an organizing principle of supranational human politics. And under the great question mark of what was to replace it came two grand alternatives, two world visions that while they both strongly affected each other, they are fundamentally paradigmatically different. The one is the international system that we know today. That is the path that we ended up with, whereby humanity is strictly divided by law to a couple of hundred independent sovereign governments. In this paradigm, these governments are considered as the rightful representatives of their populations, even when it's as clear as daylight that many governments rule undemocratically by sheer force, a very significant portion of humanity. Not less important, in international trade, these governments are considered as the legal owners of their territories, holding the su supreme right to sell their natural resources to whomever they choose. So these governments are basically free to do whatever they want to the people that they govern, and they are not accountable to anyone. The competing paradigm that had emerged at the time the one that was eventually not taken, was the idea of a world federation. The idea that the whole of humanity can and should be united into one federal state system. This idea sounds very strange to us today, but in that special moment at the end of the Second World War, it was very commonsensical and extremely popular. It was loudly advocated by a wide movement of activists, thinkers, and leaders around the world. In 1942, for example, when the Indian Congress, led by Gandhi and Nehru, demanded Britain to get out of India in the famous Quit India Resolution, they repeatedly emphasized the necessity of a world federation. On no other basis, they wrote, can the problems of the modern world be solved? Can you imagine that? That at the height of their struggle against foreign oppression, the Indians declared that the alternative to imperialism that they seek is not complete national sovereignty, but rather the sharing of sovereignty on the global level. The opposite of empire, they said, is not national independence in an anarchic international system, but rather political interdependence of all the citizens of the earth. The idea was so influential and mainstream that in 1949, the two houses of the United States Congress endorsed a resolution to, quote, strengthen the United Nations and seek its development 
into a world federation with powers adequate to preserve peace, prevent aggression through the enactment, interpretation and enforcement of world law. Okay, not international, but world law. This amazing resolution was supported by 111 congressmen and congresswomen, Republican and Democrat. Among them were the future presidents, Gerald Ford and John F. Kennedy. Now, these are Americans. They know that the word federation means giving up a very meaningful part of your national sovereignty to a higher and very inclusive level. It means that all nations will send their soldiers home and come under a global rule of law where it is up to the federal courts and the federal police to preserve peace and prevent aggression. Moreover, the words World Federation means that there will be also a global tax system with no tax havens where we see today the super rich and the big corporations stashing away their profits. And this is a very big thing because if we had such a system there, there would have been sufficient funds to provide global public goods that can start with security and safety, but can easily continue to education, to healthcare, infrastructures, and public services and other means of a welfare state, but global. This is the world that we could have been living in, but in that grand crossroads that humanity stood before at the end of the imperial era, we ended up taking the other path. Few weeks after that resolution of the US Congress, atomic engineers of the Red Army managed to detonate their first atomic bomb and the terrorized United States replied with starting the development of a hydrogen bomb and so the great arms race began. The Cold War had many victims on many fronts, but it's often forgotten that one of the earliest and maybe the greatest among them were the idea of a world federation and the movement that championed it. The end of the Cold War created a new window of opportunity for the revival of that idea. Only that, by then, the paradigm of the anarchic international system was enhanced with a formidable rising power. That was the global market and the hegemonic movement that advocated it, neoliberalism. The fall of the Soviet Union was generally regarded as a sign that confirmed the neoliberal creed that the state is always the problem and the market is always the solution. The world federalist notion about the necessity of having a state at the global level then was in a very unfavorable condition. It became common sense that the market can work best when it is global, but God forbid to think that a state mechanism such as democracy and the rule of law could also work best at that level. But of course, we know very well that applying the global market on the framework of divided states had a major role in creating some of the worst governments in the world. There is just no way that you can explain the power of Putin and his government without remembering that Russia is the largest player in the global fossil fuels market. It is the largest exporter of fossil fuels. You can't explain the power of Saudi Arabia, of Iran, of China, without the global market. The neoliberal belief that the state is redundant was reinforced in the 90s by the rise of non-governmental organizations. The NGOs reflected the notion that in order, for example, to protect the global environment, we don't need such a mechanism as a Ministry of the Environment at the global level that will hold the adequate powers of regulation and enforcement and that is grounded in a political system that represents all the citizens of the world. We don't need to go that far. It's enough to have just a completely voluntary organization, such as Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth, who have no authority, no accountability, and yet they captured the hope that someone will do something to protect the environment and that somehow it will be effective. We don't need 
to give the victims of the pollution and climate change the right to vote out of office politicians on the global level who fail to protect the environment. We just need to sign petitions and hand them over to the politicians of our local governments and hope that somehow those politicians will be so impressed with the petitions that they will actually have the guts to say no to the offers that they get from the global corporations. How does it work? Well, I think that it's best to quote on this Kumi Naidu, the former director of Greenpeace himself, who often says in his lectures, we are winning important battles, but we are losing the planet. NGOs provided the sense that if people should be protected from injustice or oppression, we do not need, say, a justice system of federal courts and police and to give them a vote at the global scale. No, we just give a few dollars to Amnesty or some other human rights organization who has no authority or accountability for ending injustice. And yet these non-governmental organizations came to capture a very large chunk of the hope for the realization of justice and social betterment in our world. I think it's high time we openly acknowledged that the Indians in 1942 were right. We need a world federation because on no other basis can the problems of the modern world be solved. Let me give you another example. When the renowned British economist Lord Stern published his famous report in 2006 on the economics of climate change, his conclusion was that, I quote, Climate change is the result of the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. The market failure is that those who harm others by emitting greenhouse gases generally do not pay the cost of the harm. The cost is externalized. And the thing is that there is just no serious way to fix market failures other than some kind of governmental intervention. In order to internalize the cost of harm into the price of fossil fuels, you need to apply either taxation or regulation or adjudication, and all of them are justice mechanisms that are the prerogative of a state. And therefore, it shouldn't come to us as a huge surprise that if we have a market of fossil fuels working at the global level, and we have no government at that same level to fix the failures of the market that we get then the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. So let me end with this final observation. The division of state power in the world to 200 sovereign states causes problems of first and second orders. A problem of the first order is that the governments of those states are too small and weak to tackle global issues. And even when they voluntarily come together in international forums, they cannot do it. The problem of the second order is that movements for social betterment and justice, who wish to exert pressure on those governments and to mobilize them into action, find themselves even more divided, fractured and ineffective in promoting their goals. Each of the devastating crises that plague our world, such as rising global inequality, insecurity, injustice, climate change, and corruption, each of them should be regarded not as a problem per se, but rather as a symptom of our undemocratic world order. It should be recognized that none of those symptoms can be seriously cured without democracy at the global level. It is high time that the people and movements who care for social betterment would come together and focus their energies on reviving this necessary vision. Thank you very much.